Hello, I am Dr. Lance Whitlock with Progressive Dairy Solutions Incorporated. In the next few minutes, I'm going to share some tips with you that will help you to save money by decreasing shrink loss in your silage operation. The tips will primarily apply to silage bunkers and drive over piles, but many of the tips are also applicable to silage bags and even upright silos. Economic losses from shrink are highly variable. They can range from as little as single digit shrink from eight to nine percent to as high as 30 percent and even higher. In the field we routinely see shrink at 15 and even 20 percent. The good news is we have many options we can use to lower that shrink loss and save you money. If we lower shrink loss by 5%, if we take it from 20% down to 15%, that means for every 1,000 tons of silage that we harvest, we save 50 tons. If the value of that silage is $45 per ton, that means we save $2,250 for every 1,000 tons we harvest, or we save $22,500 for every 10,000 tons of silage that we harvest. Dr. Keith Bolson, Professor Emeritus at Kansas State University and 4-H Management Consultant with Keith Bolson's and Associates has outlined three steps that we can take to significantly decrease dry matter loss. These three key steps are to increase the dry matter density of the silage, to properly cover the silage, and then to manage the feed out face to minimize exposure to oxygen. When chopping silage, the first key is to make sure that we chop at the appropriate moisture content for the type of silage that you're harvesting. We want to make sure the silage is not too wet where we lose our most soluble nutrients, but at the same time we want to make sure the silage is not too dry. If the silage is too dry, it is much harder to exclude oxygen out of the silage and we have more extensive deterioration of the silage. The next thing is that we want to make sure we chop the silage at the length that we want it cut. You need to make sure you work with your nutritionist when you do this, but you want to make sure that it's chopped long enough to have effective fiber for the cow's diet, but at the same time we want it chopped short enough that we can pack it easily and exclude oxygen out of the center. Additionally, we need to make sure we process any corn silage to break up all corn kernels and to break up any of the corn cobs. We need to make sure that every piece of corn is, is significantly nicked. A good way to do this is to take a 32 ounce cup, fill it with silage, and if you have two or more kernels that are not nicked, then you need to make sure and tighten the rollers on your processor. Also, you don't want to see whole pieces of cob in your corn. You want to make sure that that's broken up. Otherwise, cows will refuse to eat that and sort that out of their diets. When we bring silage in to fill our bunkers or our piles, we want to make sure and layer it up on the pile in thin layers. If we have the layers too thick, we're unable to compress the silage adequately at the bottom to squeeze out any oxygen in that silage. Additionally, we want to make sure we have enough weight on the silage pile to compress the silage. One quick rule of thumb that you can use to determine if you have enough weight of pack tractor on your silage pile is to multiply the number of tons of silage that are coming into your pile per hour by 800. That means for every 100 tons of silage that you're harvesting per hour, you need 80,000 pounds of pack tractor. Most of the time when we do this calculation, we find that we don't have anywhere near enough weight on the silage to properly pack it. Often, simply adding one more pack tractor to the pile is enough to significantly increase the dry matter density of the pile. Even though the silage pile can become crowded with that extra pack tractor, it is very effective in decreasing shrink loss. Every effort should be made to do it when needed. Another key is to make sure that any tractor that's being used to push silage or to pack the silage is constantly on the pile packing. 
We want to make sure that the tractor is not sitting and waiting for the next load to come. Finally, we want to fill the silage as quickly as possible while maintaining enough weight on top of the silage to effectively pack it. The second step is to seal your silage as quickly as possible because oxygen is the biggest enemy to making quality silage. We want to exclude the oxygen as quickly as possible, otherwise we end up with extensive deterioration which can impact animal performance and even cause health problems. The keys to covering and sealing your silage pile effectively are to do it quickly, to use 6 to 8 mil polyethylene plastic that also has UV protection. In addition, there is newer plastic on the market called oxygen barrier film, which is much less permeable to oxygen. This oxygen barrier technology means much less oxygen is able to make it through the cover, and we see a greatly decreased amount of spoiled silage on the surface. In the past, I used to recommend removing any spoiled silage that you see on the top of a pile. I no longer make this recommendation because of the risks associated with removing silage from the face or the top of the pile. I don't want to take the chance of any employees getting injured if the silage were to collapse. But by following the steps that we're outlining today, you can significantly reduce the dry matter loss and the spoilage on the top. And if you choose to use the oxygen barrier technology, you can virtually eliminate spoilage on the top. The final step to decrease the shrink that you experience in your silage piles is to manage the feed out face properly. When we first plan to make a silage pile, we need to consider how much we're going to feed every day. We want to make sure we feed the silage faster than the silage can spoil. It is crucial that we feed across the entire silage face every day. In cooler months, we should aim to feed at least 9 to 12 inches and in warmer months we should try to feed 12 to 18 inches. That makes sure that we feed the face faster than the silage can spoil. The thing that we have to remember is that silage is penetrating the face of the pile and is going back into the pile before we even feed that silage out. Additionally, we should have a plan on how we're going to take the silage off of the face. We need to do it in a way that minimizes the disturbance to the face so that air cannot penetrate further back. The best way to do it is to, to shave the silage from the side. If that is not possible, such as in the case of this bunker silo, then the best technique is to start at the top and shave the silage down. We may have to use a chip technique where we take a small chunk of silage out of the bottom and then we chip the silage down on top of it. If we go and lift up in the silage, then we allow air to scoot back into the silage pile. One word of caution though, if we are going to shave the silage from the side, is make sure the height of the silage is not such that an avalanche could occur and silage could fall onto the operator of the loader. There are two attachments that you can attach on the front of your front end loader or tractor to help you manage the face properly. The first of those attachments is called a silage facer, which is a rotating drum with teeth on it that shaves the silage as it's lowered along the face. The second is a rake, which is claw-like teeth that shave the silage down as the bucket is lowered. In summary, following these three simple steps can save you significant money over the course of the year. Again, the three steps are to increase the dry matter density, to cover your silage properly and quickly, and to manage the feed out face to minimize spoilage.